Sermon 135, True Love Chapel here in Washington State, Eastern Washington. And uh, we are in Revelation chapter 14 today, verses 14 through 16. And uh, obviously we're coming to the year, the end of the year. We have covered the entire New Testament. If you have been keeping up with the reading plan, you have gone through the entire New Testament in 2018. We're going to do the same thing next year, 2019. So I would encourage you to uh, to join us, to get on board, follow the reading plan. It's really uh, beneficial uh, for your Christian walk to, to go through the Bible and read through it every year. Still... Um, Still deciding how we're going to handle the Old Testament next year. If it's going to be a reading assignments weekly on the Old Testament, or if we're just going to um, do like one chapter um, a day of Old Testament. I I kind of like doing the one chapter. You won't be able to finish the Old Testament in the in the year, but you will have you'll able to spend more time, you know, because there's a lot to read in the Old Testament. And if you're trying to finish the whole thing in one year, you might just end up flying through it. You don't have the t- chance to like s- kind of slow down and look at it um, in more detail. But the, definitely the New Testament, we're going to be going through um, the entire thing next year and every year. That's the plan. So let's pray. And uh, Reaping the Earth's Harvest is the title of this message. Almighty God, please bless this sermon. Bless your church. Um, help us to uh, to carry out your will and um, strengthen us and encourage us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Passage: Reaping the earth's harvest. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. There we go. Um, Three verses. This is probably, you know, and there's a lot to cover. The, The reading assignment this year had us going... Through I think it was chapter 13 through 17. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff happening there, a lot of symbolism and all that. But um, as it turns out, we're going to just just take a look at something, an idea that's very simple about the the earth reaping the earth's harvest. So, um, so in the passage we have Jesus Christ. He's the Son of Man. He's the one who is. Um, sitting on the cloud uh, has have on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle and then um, another angel is uh, come out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud so an angel is coming out of the temple this is a vision in heaven so there's a temple in heaven Right? There's a heavenly temple, there's a tabernacle. The, the one on earth was a copy of that, you know, that they had previously before it was destroyed. And then, um, so the angel comes out of the temple and he's crying out to Jesus, telling him to take out, to thrust his sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap the harvest for the earth. The harvest of the earth is red. And so he who has sat on the crowd thrust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. We got symbolism there. Some some people thought it was strange that an angel would be telling Jesus what to do. You know, telling Jesus to thrust his sickle into the earth and reap it. Shouldn't Jesus be calling the shots? Well, certainly he is. He is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. But it uh, doesn't mean that he's not involving his creation in his work. You know, Jesus is God. There's one God, um, eternal Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That equals one God. Jesus being the 
Son of God, is the second person of the Trinity, fully equal with God, fully equal with the, the Father and the Holy Spirit and Jesus, all three equal one God. Three persons, one God. Three, um, one what and three who's. Okay, so that's the Trinity. And um, so to put it another way, Jesus is God. He is fully God. He's the creator of all things. Um, Jesus is the God who spoke and the universe leapt into existence. The uncaused first cause. Everything that exists has to have a cause. Um, everything that was brought into creation was created by something. But Jesus and, um, and God, the entire Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, was not created, obviously. It has existed forever and was did not need a creator because he is the creator. He is the ultimate source of all things. And um, so that being said, um, Jesus being God, he's still using his creation. The angels, people, the church, you know, these are things that God has created and he's using us as he sees fit for his glory, um, involving us in his work. So in this case, we have an angel that... God is using to uh, to involve in the in the work, and this has to do with the end times. And I believe what this is talking about, this is reaping the earth's harvest. This is talking about the people that are saved, the people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ and are saved. And reaping them means gathering them up to heaven. The next part, uh, the next verse after, from verse 17 on. It says, reaping the grapes of wrath. That's the heading in the New King James Version. And it goes on to the bowls of judgment and all that, where the wrath of God is being poured out on the earth. And there's, there's a reaping there as well. The ones that rejected Jesus are facing judgment, you know, for what they've done. They're being judged on the earth. The earth is being judged, and they're going to also be thrown into hell for all the eternity where they're judged in the final sins. So that's what's going on. Uh, reaping the earth's harvest is about um, gathering up the Christians. Now some would call it the, uh, the rapture. Um, certainly there's a rapture um, it's mentioned in Thessalonians but I believe that, that the rapture is something that occurs at the second coming of Christ, where we're caught up together in the clouds with the, with the Lord. What I think is happening here is that um, basically the church, yeah, the church will be declining in the world and eventually reach a point to where it's taken out of the world. Now, how that exactly happens, we have a, the Im imagery of a sickle going in and he's as if he was just reaping you know the way you would cut down wheat or something but what actually happens to the to the church do they die out are they martyred or are they sort of uh, miraculously just raptured um, doesn't exactly say um, a lot of people think it would be a rapture where we're, the church is caught up and that's fine but I think um, it gets complicated when you look at the 144,000 that are uh, saved. They, they say that that would happen after the rapture. Personally, I think the rapture is just the final the thing that happens at the second coming. I mean, the timeline is what gets tricky in Revelation. But if you look at some of the just the main and plain ideas to keep you, uh, keep you on the right track. The main idea is that God is going to judge the earth. And he's going to save his people. And the only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ. That is, That was the only way. That's why Jesus Christ um, suffered and died the way he did. Because that was the only way to save us. He knew that we were not able to save ourselves. He knew that we were not able to keep the law. So uh, he knew that sin, you know, the wages of sin is death. So... He chose to die in our place as a free gift offering us salvation so that all we have to do is put our faith in Jesus Christ, make the decision to follow him, and we are saved. And then let God decide 
the timeline of when we're going to be raptured, when we're going to be reaped, or whatever. God can do it. We can speculate on it. We can, you know, and it is interesting to study the, the Bible and try to figure it out what the timing is going to be. But the exact timing, no one knows. No one knows when the second coming is going to be. There's a little bit of a mystery there. But one theory for you is that the church is going to die out. And um, obviously, what happens if the church is, is, is declining? Fewer Christians on the planet. More evil would, would be taking place on the planet Earth because, well, it's Christians that are suppressing the evil in the Earth. Or more accurately, it is the Holy Spirit living in us, the Spirit of Christ living and dwelling in the believers and followers of Jesus Christ that is causing good on earth and without that you know you know the 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 devil would lie to people and make them think that christians are the problem and say oh christians are not tolerant they're not accepting of us um, and all our different beliefs and things like that and um but actually um christians are not the problem the problem is evil and uh you know truth truth is very hostile towards falsehood that's just the way it is and god and evil cannot coexist what fellowship does light have with darkness and uh, any claim of truth is exclu excluding those who are following a lie so yeah it is it is a little bit like that that we're not you know accepting of different viewpoints because christians have a very narrow viewpoint which is the one truth there's one truth the way the truth and the life the deal no man comes to the father except through jesus christ um one difference is well we can prove that you know <laughs> christian theologians christian apologists can absolutely prove it christianity is the only worldview that cannot be refuted every other worldview is refuted uh, self-refuting factually um, inaccurate or various, you know, impossibility to their belief system, except for Christianity has the logical, coherent belief system that um, cannot be refuted because it is the truth. Um, yeah, so now if the church is declining, um, evil is rising, and there, there would be a time when if the church is just declining, 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 fewer and fewer people in the world, there would be a time, wouldn't there, that there would be as few as 144,000 people, literally, that are saved. And in fact, in verse 14, it is talking about that, the Lamb and the 144,000, chapter 14, rather, the chapter we're in. Um, it's talking about these... Uh, 144,000 that are saved. Now, 144,000 is probably a symbolic number to represent the 12 tribes of Israel times the 12 disciples times a thousand. So it's a symbolic um, God's people from the old covenant to the new covenant to times a thousand, a thousand being a number symbolizing a great multitude. So it's a symbolic number which also probably could have a literal fulfillment. Stay with me here. If, if the church is declining, it goes from millions down to hundreds of thousands down to 144,000, and then perhaps that would be the time of this reaping of the earth's harvest that this is talking about here. And um, imagine that out of how many billion people on earth, if just if 144,000 were the only ones that were saved, the earth would be a very hostile place, by, by and large, especially towards God. And, um, and the day of the Lord would come like a thief in the night. The whole world would, would be blindsided to it, because pretty much the whole world would be not following Christ. And I remember what Christ said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? He'll find some. Um, perhaps it is these 144,000 that he would find. And now, and you look at 
change over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there was an interesting thing there. That uh, from verse 5 it says, Do you not remember that when I was still with you I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So, think about that. So we're talking about this, the mystery of lawlessness. It's already at work. It's the devil that's working in the world. Okay, we got that. At the end of this verse, verse uh, 8, it says... Uh, it says that the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So that's the second coming of Christ. So <clears throat> before the second coming of Christ, we see it says, verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. This is preceding the second coming of Christ. And notice that he, in verse 7, is capital in both cases, in both uh, usages. He is capitalized. This is, uh, it says uh, in the footnote, new text reads the Lord. It is talking about the Lord. It's talking about God. In other words, God is restraining the devil's work on the earth until he is taken out of the way. What do you think that means? I mean, to me, I think that, that what that could mean, remember, the, the Christians, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit living in us. This is the Shekinah glory of God living inside the, the hearts of believers, just joined to our spirit. And... Um, that that light of Christ is in the Christians on the earth today. If the Christians are declining in the world, eventually there would be fewer of that, and then this man of lawlessness would begin to have free reign because there would be less of this Holy Spirit, less of these temples of the Holy Spirit walking around, less good in the world to stop the evil. And so, yes, the world would get really bad at that point. And um, Christians would be taken out of, the, out of that. The earth would be judged. And then finally, it says, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the lawless one will be revealed. It will be revealed that it was the devil that was deceiving the world the whole time. Um, the world would be totally deceived, except for these 144,000. And, uh, you know, the second coming of Christ would, would just hit them like a thief in the night. They would have no idea that that was coming. They were thinking that they had it under control or whatever, but they didn't. And um, then Christ comes, he destroys the, the, if the, de the devil, destroys the evil, con says consume with the breath of his mouth. The breath of his mouth is the word, the word that comes out of his mouth, which is, you know, the word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword. God speaks and it happens. He speaks truth. God cannot lie. As I said, God speaks spoke and the universe leapt into existence. So God can just speak and create vast galaxies and, and everything. All time, space, and matter came from God out of his own creation, his own handiwork. So he's unlimited in power, unlimited in knowledge and wisdom. He knows everything. He can do everything. God is totally in control. And it's absolutely no problem for him to speak and completely destroy the devil. Which is what he's going to do. Destroy with the brightness of his coming. His second coming. 
And uh, so we do have that to look forward to. Um, a lot of people wonder why is why doesn't God just do that right now? Um, why is evil allowed to to exist for so long and cause so much suffering and all that? Um, certainly, I mean, God has the answer. God has the the wisdom. God knows what He's doing. He has a plan. We're in it. We don't understand it entirely. But we know that God has the perfect plan and he's causing all things to work together for our good, for those who love him, for his people. And so even the, even the evil in the world, God uses for good. What the enemy meant for evil, God uses for good. So there's a greater good that happens as a result of this temporary, light, momentary affliction, you know, where we do suffer for a time, which... Whether you're, you know, you live 10, 20, 30, 40 uh, years or 100 years, that's your time to suffer on the earth. You know, there's still a lot of good in the world because God is still here, but um, there's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of, you know, stuff like that too. But it's, it's short, 100 years maybe. Your, your life is like a vapor. It's here and then it's gone. Eternity is, is what counts. Eternity is forever. Millions and billions of years do not even scratch the surface of eternity. It's everlasting. And so I, I do believe that God has in His mind, His plan, the best thing for us for eternity. He's not just thinking about the 50 years or 100 years that you're going to be here on the earth. He's thinking, you know, if, if you got to suffer here on the earth, that's preparing you, preparing your character, causing you to seek after God, um, increasing your faith in God, causing you to become a good and faithful servant of Jesus Christ, then it's worth it. You'll be rewarded for that for all eternity. Um, and then also in this uh, sermon we've been talking about the, the devil, about the evil in the world. There's a lot of it. I'm talking about it's going to increase a lot of people are uh, worried about that, anxious about that. Um, but Jesus, uh, Jesus wants us to not worry. He wants us to uh, cast our cares on Him, for He cares for us. And as the Bible has told us, greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. So, sure, the devil would love to harm us, but he can't do anything without God's permission. And so everything that happens is actually ultimately in God's hands and God is not allowing anything to happen that would not be best for you. So don't worry about it. Um, just trust God. And uh, um, yeah, <laughs> that's the ultimate conclusion of this sermon. Trust God, trust his plan. Um, know that it is happening all around us. Um, the good will get better, the bad will get worse, and we're here in the middle of it, but there's a plan that God has, and uh, the way we fit into that plan is to, to put our faith in Jesus Christ, to daily walk after Christ, daily take up our cross and follow Christ, to join the good fight, fight the good fight, run the race to the very end, uh, don't give up no matter what. Do not grow weary of doing good, for in, good, for in uh, due season you will reap the harvest if you do not give up. Um, so let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for the sermon. Please help us, strengthen us, help us have the right mindset that is eternal-minded, heavenly, kingdom-minded. Uh, help us to resist the devil. Please protect us from evil. Please use us in your work strengthen us, lead us, and guide us. And uh, we thank you for all your blessings, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.